I can. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Impacting Life 24-7 with your host, C.L. King. Coming to you live from the High Definition Studios here in Jacksonville, North Carolina. I need to check the, the live to see if I'm all alone. I don't know if any of the staff is going to be on to help me tonight. And um, I might have to do everything myself. <laughs> but that's okay, ladies and gentlemen. I kind of started that way. But I wouldn't want to go back to those days. I certainly wouldn't want to go back to the days when I was doing it all alone because I don't know if I'd want to listen to this show. <laughs> that was that was some traumatic times back then, but it was good times. You know why? Because we were learning, we were growing, we were expanding, and that's truly what life is about, you know? And when you talk about growth, when you talk about expansion, you know, we were talking with uh, my friend Vince from New Zealand last night, you know, a marketing strategist. When you talk about growing, a lot of people want to get from one listener to 50,000 listeners overnight. And it does not work like that. It doesn't happen. There's, there's, there's no way you can do it. I go on, we go on and look in our analytics every week. And I'm just like, wow, a new country is downloaded or a new, a new state is downloaded. Slow, steady, progressional growth is important. Small steps lead to great distances. And so that's why we're blessed to have you guys listening with us every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday on Impacting Life 24-7. And every night we bring somebody new into this virtual studio. That's I love it, man. I mean, it's like, man, this is like Christmas every, every week. Now, are you a parent? Are you a mom? Are you a dad? I know I am, and I know my wife is. And I've had the privilege of discussing, yeah, I've had the privilege of discussing a topic that is near and dear to uh, both of our hearts, and, and it'll be near and dear to your heart too. And that is parenting uh, and understanding, you know, at least trying to understand this whole element of, you know, is parenting overwhelming? Deborah, my guest tonight, knows exactly how you feel. When she found out she was going to be a mom, Deborah was completely unprepared. Like, <laughs> I know the feeling. She spent the next decade or so worrying about messing up her daughter's life and channeling all the skills she had developed helping her students and parents. It wasn't until her daughter finally reached middle school that Deborah felt a iota of confidence as a mom. She felt a small little bit of confidence as a mom. You don't have to go through that. This is why we, this is why I love this show, ladies and gentlemen, because we bring people to you that you can leave with stuff. You get goodie bags on this show. You don't have to you don't have to go through that. Your kids are waiting for you to figure it out. Okay? They're just like, "Okay, mom and dad, what y'all going to do?" As a parent and life coach, Deborah's job is to help you recognize what you're doing right and to add supplemental strategies. She's got uh, some great books that we're gonna talk about tonight, but I want you guys to get ready. Moms and dads, kick the coffee table to the side, put your listening ears on, get your notepad out, and let's discuss this whole thing about parenting and understanding what we're doing. Welcome to the Impacting Life Studios, Miss Deborah Davis. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much. I am so glad to be here. Yes, it is our delight to have you on Impacting Life 24-7. And this is a very unique set of circumstances for us because you are one of the few in the last couple of years that we didn't pre-interview, but we saw the amazing topic that you were having and, and that you bring to the table and that you've lived. And we said, you know what? Let's get Deborah to talk to our folks. And so all the way up there in Connecticut, is it warmed up up there yet? Oh, it's gotten beautiful. We're like at 82 degrees here. It's lovely. Oh my goodness. That's like a, that's like the Sahara desert in Connecticut. Cause y'all have measured snow and feet, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, my friend and, and uh, she's uh, doing a great work, Deborah Davis, uh, Deborah, it, just so we can get the ball rolling. If you could tell people some ways that they could contact you, what are, what are some of the ways that people can connect with you? I'm on all basic social media, but my website is DebraAnnDavis.com. That's D-E-B-O-R-A-H-A-N-N -N, Davis, D-A-V-I-S.com. And you can email me at info at DebraAnnDavis.com. 
And I'd love for you to reach out because I have a free book for you if you do. For all your listeners, CL, and they can get a copy of, it's a digital book called How to Get Your Happy On. Mm. How send me an get- email and I'll send you a copy of the book. Yeah, you got to get a copy of that book, How to Get Your Happy On. And and it's not it's not exactly what you think. So she's she's going to she's going to give you some insights that you can definitely take away. And here's one of the things that I love about guests like Deborah is that they're all, you know, these are givers. Um, you know, people who come on to our show, they're givers, they're contributors, and they they're interested in making an impact. And so Deborah, we really appreciate you. Just go to debraanddavis.com. She's very diligent to spell it out because any person's name that I have to spell Deborah. I always spell it wrong, Deborah. Always. I know. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes people will ask me when I'm giving a giving my information over over the phone, they'll say, okay, what's your last name? I'll say King. And they'll say, uh, what what is that again? I'll say K-I-N-G. And they're like, oh King. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> so Deborah, you know, here we are um closing out a school year and we're going to unpack quite a bit tonight uh your over three decades of education and stuff but give us give our audience and and our folks watching and listening a little bit of insight to who deborah davis is well tell us a little bit about, about yourself i'm um a very upbeat person i'm a I'm a generally happy person who looks back on my life and says you know I, i've had a very easy life and then the people who know me say really? What about this? And what about that? And what about that? And I I think, oh, yeah, I forgot about that. But I'm the kind of person who thinks everything is a learning opportunity. So even when I was living in a hospital for a couple of months, because I had two broken legs, a broken thumb and a broken nose because of a collision with a um, drunk driver, Mm. I learned so much from that about the world, about myself, And I was able to bring that to my classroom when I became a teacher afterwards. Yeah. And, and, you know, that, that's interesting that the, the, I guess you can concur or or at least maybe get me straight, Miss, Miss educator. Uh, Do you feel life is constantly teaching us? Yeah. Well, let me say this. There are life definitely constantly has lessons. It's whether or not you're listening or paying attention. Uh, I decided I was going to be a lifelong learner a long time ago. Yeah. And you can stop learning. But that doesn't mean the lessons aren't there. So <laughs> if you're going to be a lifelong learner, by the way, if you're a parent, that is a great thing to model for your kids. Then you will always see lessons in the life that you're living. Yeah, that's right. And and you know, my kids sometimes when they hear me you know, here, oh, Lord, here goes dad again. One of these, you know, one of these speeches is like, oh, is he practicing for another motivational speech? And I'm just like, no, you know, really, it is it is about the, the lesson. I might not like the learning. I, I mean, I, I might not like the 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 grind that I had to go through, um, uh, which would probably not be the learning, but the lesson. I might not like all of the the pain and the suffering or whatever the case may be, but but what I learned from it is what I can take with me for for the rest of my life. And uh, so you you are a, you're a mom, and uh, how many children do you have? I have one. And so and 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 so one of the things that I that I I found interesting when I was looking at what you submitted for our show and and kind of your your bio is you know hey look there are nuances and there are things that our children do. And this relationship between a, a mom, a dad, a parent, this relationship is an ever evolving one. And what, you know, what, what stuck, stuck out to me is probably what everybody in our live environment can see how to keep your daughter (laughs) uh, from slamming the door. And I was like, man, yes, I, I don't really, I don't know if I can tolerate door slamming here in this in this house, but I can definitely get the 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 metaphor behind it. And and so when we when we look at how to keep your daughter from slamming the door, which is one of your books, um, what was your motivation behind? Because we live like I told you, we live in a very 
young military town. There's a ton of parents here. And our audience, you know, there will no doubt be some parents still navigating this whole parenthood thing. So when let, let's just get right to it and give them as much as we can tonight, Deborah. When you talk about keeping your daughter from slamming the door, what, what was the motivation behind that? The, the interesting thing is the that wasn't the first book. The, mm -hmm. the first book is the one that motivated me for that book. And the first book hasn't even been published yet. I had uh, two children, two teenagers, they're like sophomores, come into my room after school one day and they were um, hiding. One of them, now we're talking 15 year old girls, right? One of them had an abusive boyfriend mm. and he was stalking her at her locker. And they wouldn't tell me who this person was except that to tell me that he was not one of my students because they knew I would report him. Mm -hmm. And then, um, because honestly, if you've got a boy that is going through that, he needs to have somebody help him. It's not like he needs to be punished. He needs to be rescued. But anyway, um, they wanted to use my room for a locker so he wouldn't be able to find them. Right. And I said, fine, as long as you don't bring the drama to my classroom. But in exchange for that, you have to come and stay with me after school one day a week. And we're going to talk about relationships because they told me that this girl had been through these kinds of relationships since the seventh grade. Mm. So obviously there was a pattern here. And I knew that I couldn't criticize her choices and I couldn't make her feel uncomfortable because otherwise they would just come and put their butts in the seat and they wouldn't participate wholly. So I had to come up with ways where I could approach them that they could get engaged with and and feel safe so i created all these little activities and we did one every week and basically what i was doing was having them make lists of um their ideal guy all the characteristics everything like of course they were kids so they would go through um what he would look like and and what he would drive and, and money he would make and that kind of stuff Right. And then I made him go deeper with, you know, how do you want him to treat his parents and how do you want him to treat you? And so it was those kinds of exercises. So they would do it and then they would compare what they would write and then they would giggle. Hmm. So to make a long story short, at the end, we created these little cheat sheets so that they, of, of the 10 most important things that they absolutely had to have in a relationship and their lists were different from each other. I'm interested now. <laughs> and, and so then um, about five years later, I ran into one of them and, and she was working at a um, convenience store and she shrieked, Mrs. Davis, and came running out and gave me this big bear hug. And then she says, look at this. And she pulls out her wallet and she had her little cheat sheet. And this is like five years later. She had laminated it. Oh, wow. And she said, you know, I have been single for two years now, but I still date, you know, a girl's got to keep busy, but if a guy doesn't, doesn't match these things on this list and I don't stay with them. And I was, I could see how proud she was. Right? right. And then she called over this other girl and said, come here, this is that teacher I was telling you about, show her yours, show her yours. And that girl had one in hers that she, they had laminated in her wallet. And that girl said, I've been single for six months. And she was proud. I didn't even know this girl. Right. And these two children, well, young women were telling me, you need to write this book and put it out there so other kids will have it. Mm. So I started putting together the book. I had used some of these exercises on my own daughter. But, um, and actually for several people, as now that I'm thinking back on it, mm. but um, I, I wasn't a writer at the time. I was full-blown science teacher. So right. I, just make, I just kept everything in a box. And then when I started this journey, the online gurus who tell you what to do to help you reach people said to me, you can't put out a book for kids because they don't buy those books. You have to put out the books for moms. So I said, I've got a book for moms. <laughs> and that's so that that's what I wrote. And, and it was all about the things that I did when I was trying to help the parents connect when they came to me for um, parent teacher conferences and things like that. Right. Usually I only saw parents when they're already upset. 
So I've had this angry parent on one side of the table and this sullen kid on the other side of the table. And we couldn't even address what they were there for because they weren't even talking to each other. So I had to figure out how to get them to talk to each other. So over 30 years, you kind of accumulate a lot of <laughs> <Yeah>. tricks <laughs> and, and you just and keep trying them, you know? Right. You, 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 you broke out, you broke down something that was really amazing. Uh, again, my guest on Impact Life 24-7, Deborah Ann Davis.com. You can go there. She is the author of a couple books. And the first one that we're talking about is how to keep your daughter from slamming the door. And and you know, you're thankfully someone like you didn't keep all of their life experiences and the wisdom that you that you gained. Uh, to yourself, you you actually gave us some help. And uh, people can find that book on your website, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. And they can get it on Amazon, they can get it in indie bookstores and Barnes and Noble. It's it's all over the place. Awesome. We love that. And and w- you talked about this that that was interesting to me. You talked about bridging, uh, bridging the gap uh, in in parenting. And and there does seem to be uh, you know, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, you know, there does seem to be as these two, two entities are growing, there does seem to be some distance that is created. But you told me about some responses that kids have, that we look at as negative, but you broke them down really good for us. Can you explain those responses that we talked about? Yes, I, I set up a bunch of what I call quick fixes, that are things that you can do you, the parents, that you can do for yourself when your stress level is rising up and you can feel your blood starting to boil and stuff, you can interrupt that and physically create happy hormones in your body, like at the drop of a hat. Okay. And they're they're tricks. That's all they are. But they are physical changes to your body chemistry. Mm. So um, I'll share three of them right now. And then we'll put them together. So the first one is called the fake smile. All right. The thing is that when you smile, the muscles in your face trigger the happy hormones and send these messages to your brain, which triggers other happy hormones. And it puts them into your system, your, your dopamine and your endorphins and all those, it puts them into your blood and starts moving them around your body. When you smile, it turns out that your body can't tell the difference when you do a fake smile. So if you just like, you know, when they say grin and bear it, if you just grit your teeth and move your lips to the side and just go a fake smile, it still creates the same thing. And you may feel a little mild sensation right under your solar plexus, right in the top of your belly when you do that. So if you're listening, just just make a smile right now and see if you feel a difference in your stomach. Okay, yeah, let me try that, okay. And that's your... Um, that's your that's your chemicals being produced artificially but right on on demand and if you're really mad flash a bunch of smiles now here's here's my cautionary statement okay if you're gonna do this if you're gonna say well i'm gonna try this next time i get mad at my kids you have to tell them ahead of time Uh, they don't think you've lost your mind (laughs) that's right if you're sitting there yelling and all of a sudden you give them this like maniacal grin they're gonna like, all right, everybody out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but yeah. So the smile, uh, you're you're saying that the body does not know when it's when it's faked or when it's when it's legit, huh? Wow, that's, that's right. interesting. That's that's powerful. Okay, so what's the second thing? All right. So the second thing is, um, before I tell you this one, you can um just take a second and feel how your stomach area feels, just so you can see before and after okay the second one is about casting your eyes upward like you're looking at some clouds in the sky not about tilting your head back but just casting your eyes up that produces happy hormones and if you cast your eyes up you might feel it in your stomach and then a third one is if you do one loud noisy exhalation and when you do that, feel that sense of relief or release yeah. in your stomach, <sighs> right? So if you put those all together, let's see what we you, got. <laughs> you have a hissy fit. 
<laughs> you have an eye rolling, sigh heaving, fake smiling teenager who is actually creating happy hormones in their body without knowing it and self-soothing. They're making things better for themselves when they're faced with a situation that they don't know what to do. They don't know what to do for that situation because if they knew what to do for the situation, they wouldn't be doing that. So when you see your child doing that, instead of taking it personally, understand that they are backed in a corner and this is helping them not explode. This is soothing them and easing them and calming them. Wow. And go ahead. if you tell them that, then they can implement it when they need it. And then when you see them doing that, when they're, you're in an altercation with them, right. then you can say, all right, you know what? I see you sighing. I see you rolling your eyes. Let's take a minute. Just do that like three times. Just do it three times and get yourself to a better place. And then instead of that being me against my child and my child against me, well, now you're both on the same side of the fence and you're both working to make that child feel better. Wow. See, and that, that's a good, that, that's, that's, that's a very good tip. You guys need to really, really try that. Uh, I'm, I'm challenging all parents out there to try these, this tip tonight, because here's what, uh, again, on Impact Life 24-7, I'm joined by Deborah Davis, and she is a parenting and life coach. She is a scientist. She's a 30-year educator. She's an author of, of several amazing books. And, and, you know, I'm thinking back, and I told you I was a former Marine. Mm-hmm. And so the Marine Corps is not a democracy. <laughs> 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 they don't ask you what you think about when they tell you to do something. And so, you know, just to be honest, you know, my early, early on parenting style, because my foster mom was like that. My foster mom was, we call, I thought she was a drill sergeant. She was just different. Um, But now when, when you look at it 30 years removed, it's like, okay, um, this could be a collaborative diffusion of a, of a, of a crisis as opposed to it's my way and that's it. Well, let me let me say this about that. Go ahead. If you're running the house, it's my way and that's it. You can still do that mm-hmm. because that could be your parenting style. I'm not saying you can't, you have to change your parenting style. What I'm saying is in the middle of altercations, you can feel better and you can teach your child to feel better in the middle of altercations, which will diffuse the altercation. Mm-hmm. So par- talk, we can have a whole different conversation about parenting styles. Yeah. And I think, I think what my thought process was is, is, is exactly that, like recognizing during the middle of this, if you would call it an altercation that you bring, you're bringing two buckets to the conversation, one with water and one with fire. Yeah. You know I mean, one with you gas. And so what are you going to put on this fire to, to, to get it out? And, and, you know, usually Marines run to the gunfire. They're like, Hey, I'm going to, and I'm going to meet this aggression with aggression. And that doesn't always work, you know, in, in, especially when your child is trying to figure their way out in life. And, and if you don't give them the, the capacity to, to get through this without it turning into a sh- shouting match and, and everything falling apart, then I think that's where parenting and child relationships get strained. Would you agree? I do. And I I would like to say, since you challenged the parents to their first thing is to try these quick fixes that I gave you, think of the quick fixes as for yourself. Those are for your own hormones to interrupt your anger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second is that you could share them with your kids and then tell them that they can start using them. But third This is something I've been talking about a lot this year, Mm -hmm. Um, mostly because so many parents all of a sudden are teaching their kids, even though that's not what they signed up for, because the kids are home. So they're supervising their schoolwork and and, um, looking over their shoulder and that kind of stuff. So I've been helping people by talking to them about their styles. So 
can I share a little bit about that right now? Yeah, go ahead because that, that's that's good because especially as we weave this into you know us coming out of this this crazy season that we've been in relative to COVID. Uh, yeah, you're right. I did not sign up for homeschooling and teaching yeah. and all that kind of stuff. That I mean, I that's just and so yeah. Give us give us some insights. So one thing is that um, you might have heard like personality tests and things like mm -hmm. that. Yep. yep. So everything you've ever heard about personality tests, I'm applying them to learning styles. Now, there is it depends on who you talk to, how many learning styles there are. I like to use three learning styles because it's only three. Mm -hmm. I've seen some that are like 21 learning styles. I'm like, well, that's overkill. But that's my personality type, right? I, I want like, give me the answer right now. I'm not exploring the fine, fine lines and stuff. Right. My husband is that person. So yeah. I'm not, give me the three. I don't want to hear the 21 of them. Right. So Go ahead. Um, the th three are kinesthetic learners. Those are people who learn through physical manipulation. Right. Audi auditory learners, people who learn by hearing. Mm -hmm. And visual learners, people who learn by seeing. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I say this can all tie in with personality quizzes is because the way you learn is the way you perceive the world, the way you take in information, the way you process information, the way you do relationships, it's the whole gambit. Mm -hmm. So if you know your child's learning style and you know your learning style, if you and your child are pretty seamless and you get along and things are okay, most likely you have compatible styles. Mm -hmm. That means that you say and do things that your kid's expecting and your kid says and does things that you're expecting. Right. Then if you end up having like more than one child and <laughs> some you bang heads with and some you don't, the ones that you're banging heads with have a different style than you. Right. And there's stuff online all over the place. I mean, I've got it on my website. If, if anybody wants this information, send me an email, info at DebraAnnDavis.com. And I will send you these things so you can you don't have to go look for it. And it's also in the book, How to Keep Your Daughter from Slamming the Door. If you have the book, it's on page 196. <laughs> anyway, um, so what you do is you identify what your learning style is. And then you identify the learning styles of your kids. And the ones who are different from you, you go look up how to bridge that gap. You don't have to make it up. That, informa that information's out there. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Right. But when you sit there and you say, you know, to your child, what's the big deal? Just sit behind the computer for a half hour and take the lesson. And they just can't get into it. That's not how they learn. Right. And you don't understand that because that is how you learn. Right. So it makes sense to you. Why aren't they sitting there? Why can't they handle this? So there's so many tips and tricks and things that you can do to enhance each child's learning style. Plus, if your child's learning style is different than their teachers, they may be having difficulty in the class that they don't need to be having difficulty in. Mm -hmm. And it's so what happens is the teacher says do A, B, and C, and the kid is struggling. They get it done, but it's not easy the way it is in that other teacher's class. I like that teacher, right? Right. And that makes them feel inadequate. That makes them feel like they are not as smart or not as capable. Right. But if you say to them, no, that teacher is a kinesthetic teacher. That teacher wants you to put your hands on things and manipulate things. And you're a visual learner. You, your person wants to watch. So that's okay. You guys are different. There's nothing better or worse. It's just different. Just different. So since you've got that teacher, we're going to figure out a way for you to be strong in that class. Mm. And it is so doable. So all these parents who have been assigned the helicopter parent position now because they're supposed to be watching their kids through the distance learning. Yeah. You need to figure out who your child is in terms of terms of a learner so that you can help them be strong in those areas. So this isn't to say, um, well, I'm an auditory learner, so I'm not going to do the visual. No, it's right. to say, 
this is where you're strong. Let's go strengthen up these other areas. You know, I, I, you're, you're not a kinesthetic person. Well, let's do some things where you can learn to manipulate things with your hands. Wow. That's powerful, man. And, and, you know, I think about that relative to me, just, just, you know, uh, you know, I need to, I need to hear it. Uh, I need to see it and then I need to do it. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of need a little bit of all three, you know what I'm saying? And, and if I have one missing, I can tell that it takes me forever to figure something out, like putting a desk together or something. I got to go do it on YouTube. One of the things that what, that I love about uh, what we, what we have again, ladies and gentlemen, I've got in our virtual studios, uh, my guest and, and uh, all the way from Connecticut, Deborah Davis, she is a, an amazing person relative to helping parents, uh, and moms bridge this gap that that sometimes does come between their kids. And I told Deborah, I said, listen, this is going to be so great because our town, our, our city, Jacksonville, which is the home of Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, is one of the youngest metropolitan cities uh, relative to age uh, in America and has also has one of the highest birth rates. So we got a lot of parents and we got a lot of young parents. But one thing that I that I always like to see is what other people say about my guest. And, I, and I'm going to do this. She didn't know I was going to do this. I didn't even tell her I was going to do this. But I do this often with my guests, what people say about uh, their books. And so someone said about Deborah, I am a mom of two teen girls. And this book has been very helpful. I've gotten some tips to apply that I did not think of uh, or I did not know yet. Excited to apply them and strengthen our relationship to have a healthier experience. Thanks, Deborah, for writing this book. And that was from Mary Elizabeth Jackson. One of the other quick ones, uh, uh, Liz says, uh, I don't know how Deborah Davis knows my daughter, but my daughter is a master door slammer. <laughs> <laughs> at least uh, she was until I started seeing how I could understand her more and uh, she could understand me. The book gave us a shared voice that we didn't have before. I have an almost 16 year old daughter who is smart, funny, independent, and just like me. We have had many struggles in the past a few years after a divorce from her father, and I found how to keep your daughter from slamming the door to be as comforting as a bear hug. I loved it. And so that's really remarkable, Deborah. That, that, and this is really what it's about. It's, a, it's not just about, you know, I'm in the process of writing my book finally after all these years. And we don't want to just write something that's just because we we write it. We want to write something that that people can get some value out of. And you're really adding value to people's lives. And so one of the things that I have been mentioning uh, parenthetically in the background is this gap that, that grows. Uh, and you talk about um, bridging the gap in parenting. So tell us, uh, give us some examples. I'm going to do the, guys, I'm going to do the, um, I'm going to reach out to our sponsors and do our sponsorship commercial at the end so we can get as much of Deborah and, and, and her insights in throughout the show, if that's okay with our, with our staff. Um, usually we do a commercial break at this time, but I want to just keep flowing and I want to just keep getting your information out there. We'll do the commercial at the end when you're, when you're back uh, chilling with your, you know, drinking coffee after the show. When we talk about the gap that's that and bridging that gap, what, how do you, number one, how does a parent even identify that there is a gap and what are some tools that you give us to help bridge it? First of all, they know there's a gap that they feel it in their gut. They know it, whether they acknowledge it or not, they know that there's a gap mm -hmm. and um, they know there's a gap. Every time a teacher tells them something that's going on in, in the classroom or in their studies and the parent is surprised and they know it's a gap when the um, child mm -hmm. stops talking to them. Right. Right. So um, keep talking to them because they do hear you. They do listen. They like I, I would tell my daughter things and she'd roll her eyes and but but when she was a, in high school, I was in my element. I knew what was going on. I knew what to say to her, how to say it, how often to say it and things. And um, and because I had the conversations early with her, they were pretty seamless when we wanted to talk. It's just that when she would get into turmoil, she couldn't talk to me anymore. So when there were things affecting her, she didn't want to talk. 
mm. when she was younger, what, I always say I hit my stride when she got into middle school because I knew what to do with those kids, right? Right. And we would start talking about things like um, sex and drinking and parties and things like that. We would have those conversations when she was too young to be concerned with those things. Mm -hmm. And I'd have them casually, you know, like we'd be sitting on the front stoop, polishing our toenails, sitting shoulder to shoulder. And I'd be just asking her questions and we wouldn't be looking at each other and we would just be talking. Or we'd have the conversations while we were on a walk and like no big deal. But I made sure I had them every single year. Mm. And each year I'd say to her, well, I hope you get out of school a virgin. And she'd say, oh, I will, mom. And then her freshman year of high school, she was a very good basketball player mm -hmm. and the older boys we're starting to notice her like the senior boys and she was eighth grade when they first noticed her and we're stepping up their attention in the ninth grade and um that summer she and i were talking and about a variety of things and i said well i hope you get out of high school at virgin and she went oh i do too <laughs> <laughs> I went, oh, okay. Uh, well, that response changed, didn't it? <laughs> Different landscape. <laughs> yeah, you know. But, but, she didn't know to say to me that I need some help. I need navigating this. She didn't know to say that. Right. But the conversations that we had all along made it a comfortable way for her to be able to tell me what was going on. I didn't know that that was the problem that that was an issue for her yet right but those conversations reveal it. it's like when you get surprised that's when you see the gaps <laughs> when you get surprised wow and man, that, that is powerful again ladies and gentlemen i'm here with deborah davis she's my guest on impact life 24 7 those of you watching live and of course those of you listening to our podcast uh she just said something that that really uh that this should resonate with all of us as parents is that maybe the approach to conversation and even those quote unquote hard conversations or uncomfortable conversations if you will you know i've i've had i've had the talk with my boys you know all the boys all my boys i've always had the talk you know about the birds and the bees and and uh but it was this official thing you know i got to take you on this you know, we got to go to this cabin 10 hours away and blah, blah everybody knows <laughs> and it's just, he's having the talk, dad. And, but, dun, 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 dun. Yeah, man, but you know, when you really think about it, um, we don't do that for everything else. And, and, and when you, what you just described for us is, is really a whole lot less offensive and and you know so much easier to digest did you, you found that to be the less case scary for the parents what it's less scary for the parents yeah absolutely less scary for the parents you know because you know it's like uh i hope you i hope when you get out of middle school you're a virgin and you're just sitting there painting like you say we're just sitting on the front porch painting our toenails and it just was like oh yeah i mean yeah that's no problem mom and but because you had already planted those seeds and already kind of went down that road that the, the next time you brought it up, it wasn't like it was the first time she heard it. Um, here's what I'm, here's what I'm finding. And I may be wrong. And, and Dr. Uh, Deborah, you can correct me on my show only once, but you can't, I'll allow it. Uh, when, when here we are in the 21st century and Social media is at everybody's fingertips. I mean, our kids, I don't even, you don't even have to have the talk with your boys anymore because they can just <laughs> they can get it right here. Um, do you find that uh, communication just in your, your, your professional experience and, and give us some analysis. Do you find that communication between parents and their children, especially in these, in these, you know, these years, that are going to be harvest years. Do, do you find that it's become less or more difficult because uh, even though social media puts everything at your foot fingertips, it's like our kids don't necessarily need us anymore because they can find out all the information right here. What do you think? They will always need us. 
we are the things that ground them. When there's all this information out there, they're not prepared to decide which they should pay attention and which they shouldn't to pay attention to. Right. And they need to have a place where, where there's a sounding board where they can talk and explore thoughts and, and even, even explore meanness without being judged mm. where they can rattle on. And the person says, the parent says, that's interesting. Huh? Really? And how does your best friend feel about that? Mm. Then those kinds of things make them have a safe environment where they can share the conversations. And you definitely have to talk to them about sex. Can I talk to you about the big myth about sex in high school? You sure can. Everyone thinks that everybody is going at it like rabbits. And it's not true. <laughs> it is not true. Okay. All the good movies perpetuate that myth. Right. So every year, because I'm a science teacher, so I can get away with this stuff, right? Go ahead. Science. Every year I would do a um, data collection survey and we have three or four questions on it. Um, do you, uh, are you sexually active? Do you drink alcohol? Do you, have you tried pod? Do you do drugs? That kind of thing. Right. And they were anonymous and filled out on bubble sheets and pencil. And I didn't even know the kids. I would do it like the first week of school. I didn't know them. And every year, every year, every year, okay? <laughs> every year, the results would come out the same. And, and now I only remember the results about sex because this is where everybody would protest. Nobody would talk about the drugs or the alcohol. It was all about the sex. Right. So, I had um, freshman, sophomore classes and I had junior, senior classes, right? So for the freshman, sophomore classes, what do you think the percentage of kids were sexually active? Mm, I don't know. Tell me. Well, would you believe like three or 4%? Oh, wow. Three or four? Oh, right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So people are going to say, they're listening. Well, that's not my, my kid's school. Okay. I taught in Hartford. I taught in Atlanta. I taught in Boston. Mm -hmm. I taught in rural um, Georgia. I taught in, I'm uh, not rural, suburban Georgia. Mm -hmm. I taught in rural Connecticut. I've taught in um, high socioeconomic places. I've taught in dirt poor, poor places. I've taught in country places where you know it's a farming community and in in high poverty levels i've taught in all of them every single year the numbers are always the same mm. what do you think the juniors and seniors numbers are like was it lower no but it was just a little bit higher it was like six seven percent really and every single year the kids would say well that's not true that's not right <laughs> and i'd say those numbers are skewed it's it's an anonymous thing. I mean, who lied? Why would you lie? I can't tell it's you. Right. And they wouldn't believe me. They would not believe me. So I said, okay, we'll do it again. So every single year, we'd do it again. We'd get the same numbers. Do you think that would convince them? Nope. Nope. Wow. It, it, they were convinced that everybody was doing it except them. They you know, all of them. It's just ridiculous. And the parents don't believe it. They don't and believe even it. Even when I share this with my daughter, she's like, Yeah, well, that's not my school. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, you, it you, is. You don't know my school, Mom. Yeah, <laughs> it is. See, the thing is, everybody says it. Right. They all say that they're being sexually active. But this is the important part people who have daughters, they are more likely to have sex if they believe those numbers. And they are more likely to regret it afterwards. Mm. There's a, this, that small percentage of girls who are doing it, it's because they think the other people are doing it and then they wish they hadn't. Mm. So if you share the numbers with them, it doesn't matter if they believe you or not. They will hear you. They will hear that somewhere in this country, they're not having sex. Right. And it's okay to wait. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. You know, I just, I. Oh, oh, one more thing. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Deborah. Keep teaching. Go ahead. These, these were my numbers, right? 
But a few years ago, well, more like five years ago now, the CDC and 17 Magazine did a survey and came out with almost the same numbers I did. See? Yep. See? And, and that know, was a national study. And they should they should have made you the chairman of the team magazine because you, you, right. you were doing it on the micro level. And, yep. and, and, and you know, I, I'm sitting here and believe it or not, I know people are saying, OK, what is this melancholy uh, cloud that has come over King? And it's, it's really not that I'm just being very reflective on what uh deborah davis our guest has has said one thing that she said i i, I was telling i was telling my co-host mike black who will be actually hosting the show for the first time this thursday guys oh y'all it won't be live so he he could make a bunch of mistakes and be cool um what i was talking to him last night because i always talk to the staff after the show the team always helps me and um i was talking to him and i was just like man people think that having your own podcast that you're the subject matter expert and people just coming onto your show because they want to get some you know exposure and notoriety but i'm like no it is really nothing like that for me i every night i'm just going to school i'm like getting an education like a free education i'm going to have three or four doctorates by the time i'm finished with this whole podcast thing and i'm just sitting here listening to what you said which which is why we do this show impact Right. And remember, I told you if it just does one, what you told me, it doesn't do just one. But I want you to know that if it did do just one and it was just me, then I know how it's going to impact some others because I'm going to go downstairs tonight and I'm going to parent different. She said something interesting, ladies and gentlemen. She said that uh, in all for all intents and purposes, that your your kids should have a safe zone with you a judgment free zone when when they're talking to you because i was asking hey look they got all this t information and bombarded with technology and everything that is at their disposal but deborah said they, they they will still need you they need you to help ground them and let me just share let me just echo what deborah said because i didn't say it to to some moms and dads out there who who may feel like well, I'm not relevant in my child's life anymore. And, you know, the school's raising them or the coach is raising them or whatever. You're still very, very valuable and important in your child's life. And let's just let's just deal with that for a minute, Deborah. This is kind of like a sidebar, but we're going to deal with it, okay? If a parent has felt like, uh, you know, a mom or a dad or both, it has felt like they've become less significant and maybe their kids are just in middle school i understand when they're my son getting ready to graduate in two weeks and i'm crying still trying to hang on to them but let's say the kids in middle school and the parents feel like they're just they're they're not connected uh do you give us and 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 your, your the folks that you coach and how you help people do you give them a way to kind of maybe remerge back on the highway of of familyhood yeah i do there's there's so many ways that you can do it um and some of them are in the book and some of them are, I, I have a, um, a newsletter also called Mary Meddling and some of the stuff is in there because I put my blog post in that thing. So um, the information is out there, but right. the thing is that um, be transparent, tell them, you know, I love you so much and I don't like the way that we are interacting. I think we can do better. So I'm going to go try to find some information and see if we can make some changes to make things better. Mm -hmm. So you just tell them ahead of time. You don't even have to have something ready to use. You could just say, you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to make things better. And um, tell them that you want to make some changes. Yeah, man, the, the intentional approach. I really yeah. like that as opposed to the subliminal i don't want you to know we're trying to work on this approach <laughs> exactly no tell them tell them outright i i don't like the way it's been it, it's been going i i don't like the fact that we fight i don't like the fact that you feel uncomfortable i don't like i i think we can do better and so i'm going to work on making things better for us this has been a crazy year and i think it's knocked us off the rails a little bit so i'm going to work to get us back on the rails and if you want to help that's great but I can do it myself. So however you want to do it. The whole thing is to say, you and me are the team. 
those problems out there are the opposition. It's not you and me opposing each other. It's you and me with all these things that the world is throwing at us all the time. And we have to navigate that together so that we can be a strong family unit. Very, very powerful. Tell us about your other book, Deborah. We're running out of time, man. This this has been, man, this, uh, I didn't, man, this has flown by. Look at it, 924. And wow. I'm just like, wow. B- because here's, here's, you know why? Because this conversation probably, you know, with, let's say, however, whatever percentage of people that listen are parents, we're all probably sitting on the edge of our seat like, wow. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm sitting here and I'm, I can't, I can't do much more with, with, with my kids. They're all all just about adults, but I'm sitting here thinking, wow, you know, there, I can still take, even with my 16 year old, I can still take some of these things and, and kind of retool and re, you know, reapproach, uh, you know, our, our relationship. That's powerful. So tell us about your other book. So did you say you have, you have one that's on, that's not finished yet or, or what, what about it? I have um, the digital one, which is how to get your happy on. And that's all these different techniques about how to increase your happiness level physically. And also the 10 best ways to raise your happiness level. So wherever you're at, happy or not so happy, it raises it up. It's important. And and I think, I think that's an important, I guess, I I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a, a, a doctor or psychologist, but I think happiness is kind of important. Don't you? It is so important because it creates a set of chemicals in your body that make your body thrive and it replaces all those stress level hormones. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said stress level, all those stress hormones that basically mess your cells up. Mm. So it's really important for your health for you to be happy. You know, and, 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 and we we were, I was talking with Vince last night, my, my, uh, my, the, the strategist over there in New Zealand, you should have heard his accent. His accent is so cool, but he talked about, he talked about this one thing that his conference that he did, he said, and, and I'm going to try it. And, uh, you know, everybody will probably think I'm crazy, but he said, one of the things relative to making yourself happy and self care is to take yourself out on a date. <laughs> Oh, that is so lovely. <laughs> and he said he did it. He said he went and bought a, uh, he's a, he's a, a Star Wars fan. So he went and bought a big old lightsaber thingy <laughs> and uh, went and uh, watched the movie and, and ate his favorite meal. And every, you know, his kids are like, dad, what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm on a date. Don't nobody talk to me. I'm, I'm with <laughs> myself. And he said the next day he actually felt so much, you know, li- so much, you know, more liberated and free and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, you know, happiness, um, is is important not just because you want this emotion, but would you agree that it's tied to your to your the physiological that your health as well? A hundred percent. It's all tied into your physical well being, <clears throat> and mm-hmm. if you adults are working on increasing your happiness. You'll be modeling that for your children, and you will be. Uh, here's an awful statistic. of our workforce in the United States, 70% has one or more chronic illnesses. So that means to me as a teacher, all my beautiful children I've taught over the years, 70% of them have one or more chronic illnesses. And that can be waylaid by having a happiness upgrade. (sighs) Wow, that man, that that that's a that's a deep statistic right there, y'all. Seventy percent of did you say the workforce or adults? Workforce. The, the workforce. workforce has a chronic has one or more chronic illnesses, and wow, that man, we mm. so we got to get happy and we got to get healthy, ladies and gentlemen. She does talk about if you like if you guys would like to connect with Deborah, I would love for you guys to connect with her. Um, and she's got so I, I put her link in the in the live chat, but I want for our podcast listeners to go to DebraAnnDavis.com and you can connect with her. She's got a free coaching strategy that she does uh, for you to connect with her, kind of like a an on ramp to her world. And this whole parenting thing, man, this is this has been very very rich. Uh, I mean, like this, this wasn't just a bologna sandwich, ladies and gentlemen, this was, this was definitely steak. And for all of my vegan family out there, this was 
tofu. So there you go. Because <laughs> I, I got some vegan friends I have to be mindful of. Um, you know, Deborah, as as we come out, because I really am speaking this into existence as a man of faith, I believe that we are coming out and we're going to see some brighter days ahead. Uh, we were we definitely went through a year of isolation and all that. Uh, and you know, all of the health reasons and all that kind of stuff and the, the other peripheral things that came with that. But but your message um, could, is definitely needed in every parenting home in America, whether we're in COVID or not in COVID, because like you said, if you have one child, that's one thing. But if you have a series of children, th- they learn differently. They absorb things differently. And, and you have to be willing to identify that and not just say, bless God, I'm the parent and you're going to, you know, there, there, I'm telling you, I've learned a lot uh, from hearing that. And Deborah, one, one, one final thing before, um, before we get ready to wrap up is I would like for you being the parenting expert and all the things that you have going on and all the years of your experience teaching and such. I'd like for you to take the next minute because there's the music. I would like for you to take the next minute and speak to our audience, um, moms, dads, folks out there, and give them a word of encouragement as we begin to go and get ready to go to summer, school's getting ready to be out. You can speak to the moms and dads and you can speak to the kids. Uh, So I'm giving you the floor, Deborah. The floor is yours. Well, the first thing I want to say is that you're already doing a better job than you think you are. When you're looking at somebody else and saying, that's a great parent, I wish I could do what they're doing. I promise you, anybody who looks like they're the super mom or super dad is getting help. So your job is to expand your circle and get some support for yourself because nobody parents alone. Nobody does. You have to get somebody to support you. I mean, think about it. You have somebody helping you get the kids to school. It's the bus driver and somebody providing lunch at the school. I mean, you have support in place in all these other areas. It's just that you need to look around and find more support. However much you need, that's what you need to go get. And you are doing better than you think you are. You've gotten your kids this far. So celebrate that. Yes. Yeah. I, I will have to concur, man. Look, I tell Chris, Hey, listen, brother, even if we have to roll you across the stage in two weeks, we made it brother. We made it. And so, uh, thank you, Deborah Ann Davis for what an encouraging and inspiring, uh, discussion that we've had tonight on impacting life 24 seven. We'll definitely have to have you back when school comes back in to revisit more of these uh, plenty of strategies that, and, and you guys can get those strategies just by going to Deborah's website, get a copy of her book, uh, Deborah and Davis.com. Uh, of course you can, you can find her on all different social media platforms. You can email her at info at Deborah and Davis. Com. I love for our audience to connect with her and uh, if you connect with her. Tell her you heard her amazing story on impacting life 24 seven. Deborah, we thank you so much. This was the, this was the fastest hour in radio. I'm, I mean, I'm just very, very blessed to have you. I, I, I loved every minute of it. All right. Well, enjoy. And uh, we appreciate you and we'll be back in touch again real soon. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you a- so much. Good, good night, everybody. Have a great night. So thank you, uh, Impact Life 24-7. This is your friend, C.L. King. And I would be here Thursday, folks, but uh, it's Chris's last band concert. And uh, they are celebrating the seniors. And Chris has poured four years into his, uh, the band. And so it's been way more than four years. Chris has poured uh, what is he, 18 now? So he's poured 16 years into the music craft. And so we're coming down to his very last performance, at least at White Oak. So we believe there'll be many, many more, but at White Oak, this will be his last one. So we don't want to miss that. And I'm thankful that Mike, my friend, Mike Black has been willing to uh, step in and uh, we have a career summit that night. And so we will have some professionals uh, from various careers that uh, we will be interviewing, getting information about how teens can, you know, what they need to do to get ready. Some some kids go right from high school into the workforce. Others uh, go 
from high school to college, others in the military, but getting helping them be prepared. And so that should be a great show. And uh, it won't be live, but we will have it posted up on all of our affiliate sites throughout. Impacting Life 24-7, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you learned something tonight. Ms. Deborah Ann Davis told us, man, that to have these conversations with your kids, uh, you're, not, you're not doing nearly as bad as you think you are. And uh, remind yourself of that, mom and dad. And she talked about those three things, man. You know, the exhale, the lifting up of your eyes and the smile, uh, you know, and put those together and you've got a child throwing a hissy fit. Man, I just never seen it that way before. So again, that's what Impacting Life 24-7 does. It, it helps, it brings impact to our lives. All right, folks. So I will be back with you on Monday uh, for another episode, but tune back in this weekend and we will have uploaded for you the uh, the career summit for our students. All right. Thank you so much. Take care.